Okay, very good morning. Wednesday the 2nd of May. Hope everyone is well. A uh, quick recap of things to cover this morning. We've got Apple's earnings from last night. We'll have a quick review of that. Uh, in the FX markets, I'm sure Sam will talk about it in a lot more detail, but um, some interesting moving averages that have been tested at the moment in both the dollar index and euro dollar. And we'll have a look at the pound given the, the move that we saw yesterday. But one thing, of course, you'll note from the charts this morning, we've had a little bit of a pullback. Uh, obviously, yesterday was a really strong day for the dollar. And those technical breaches in the pound with that negative news on the PMI is certainly uh, helping that dollar strength to some degree as well. Uh, but both pairs having a, a bit of reprieve this morning, if you like, and, uh, and back above pivot, at least in euro dollar for the time being. Uh, and we are going to have a little recap about some Brexit news. There's a few updates. And of course, this comes ahead of the uh, local elections, which are tomorrow on Thursday. So just having a quick look at things. Uh, equities here, center left chart is the DAX. Don't forget, uh, the markets were closed, obviously, in Germany as much as mainland Europe uh, for the Labor Day holiday. So don't be too shocked by the quite aggressive move on the charts this morning. A little bit of catch up if you like, because we had a positive finish broadly across the major indices last night. The Dow slight underperformer, but the Nasdaq was up uh, about 1.2%. Um, but it's the currency markets I just want to have a quick look at. Uh, the Dixie is sitting still above, that's the dollar index, the 92 handle. Uh, and this is what was one of the things we were looking at yesterday. And this is this renewed dollar rebound, if you like. Uh, with the Fed very much set on track to deliver, not tonight, but obviously in June, when we'll get their updated forecasts and they'll look to execute their second rate hike of the year. Uh, still a, uh, a sizable amount of the market on Wall Street expecting potentially that they could execute three more rate hikes to take a total of four for 2018. Uh, so dollar on a bit of a pullback and technically getting back above that 200 DMA uh, for the first time really since the, the beginning of year has been meaningful. And so that Sam will have a look, on, no doubt, in euro dollar uh, on the kind of reverse. We're in close proximity of that similar level. Uh, the one thing, though, to be aware of yesterday was the pound. And I think since the beginning of the week, we've been keeping an eye on that support zone, uh, which was here. If we look on a daily chart, there's a couple of areas here I can just kind of mark up, if you like, and... Uh, it was really that area that was quite key because what we were looking at, of course, was that previous low that we printed back in the beginning of March, the high from September, and that gave you that 137 kind of 20 to 37 handle as a kind of buffer of support. And the price kind of got to there, sat around there, and when it broke, you can see a, a decent move to the downside before seeing a bit of a bounce around those previous uh, highs that were seen right at the beginning of the year. Now the trigger point, of course, has been okay, persistent. I mean, the the weakness of the pound hasn't just come as a surprise. It's been repricing itself over the course of the last kind of 15, 16 days as the prospects of a, an interest rate hike on the 10th of May from the Bank of England have continued to uh, diminish to the point of sub 20% now at last check. Uh, so again, weak GDP, dovish Mark Carney, uh, falling inflation have all contributed to that move. And then this was the technical kind of breach in which we were looking at uh, yesterday. Uh, you might have seen the, the tweet that Piers did uh, last Friday, absolutely right on the money with that call, looking at, at the kind of trend line that had been uh, in place since the beginning of the year. That matching up then, of course, with those previous levels we just looked at and that subsequent break with the catalyst being the manufacturing PMI yesterday coming in a 17 month low uh, enabled the price action to move lower here. So on the recovery of the price today, because we are seeing a bit of a bounce, that I'd be looking at the same area again as now resistance or you know, support turned resistance in that sense. So that 137 handle could be quite interesting. You've also got pivot about 15 or so pips before the handle to, to keep an eye on today. Uh, but overall, this morning, a little bit of a pullback. But there has been some new UK economic news, if you like, overnight. And 
British shop prices. They came out from the British Retail Consortium last night, who are the BRC, and they dropped again in April. Um, so the detail here being that overall shop prices fell 1% year on year in the month of April, matching March's pace of decline, which had been the fastest fall in more than a year. So ongoing signs of muted cost pressures continue. If you remember, this was after we saw the substantial drop off in the kind of main metric, the CPI, and it's these kind of signals that people will look at to get a bit of a sense of the price pressures, the environment within the UK. And this would suggest that we're continuing to see inflation drop off fairly rapidly, which of course would supple or which would support the view that the Bank of England shouldn't hike come next week. So still a lot riding, of course, on the um, the PMIs. You've got the construction figure later on this morning. You get the service one, which is really key, which will be 9.30 tomorrow morning. But I would say at the moment, you're kind of looking at about, I would say, anything from a 15 to 20% chance. So it has fallen rapidly, as we said yesterday, from the 95% it was priced in only about two and a half weeks ago. So it's still a little bit to play for. I did read this morning on my way into work, Deutsche Bank, they're still looking for a hike. So there are a few big banks making that call still at the moment. Okay, a few other things. Apple's earnings. So Apple shares moved higher aftermarket by about 3%. Their iPhone unit sales grew 2.9%. That was in line with expectations. Obviously, there were a few concerns that potentially... Um, given a lot of the headlines that we've been seeing from various component makers about the lack of demand, which is kind of down the, the kind of chain, if you like, uh, for the actual iPhone 10, given the high value nature of that smartphone. Um, but it didn't disappoint. It was in line with expectations, which have seen as a net positive. They gave a bullish revenue forecast. Their service business, which we were looking at yesterday, continues to go to strength to strength. Um, they announced a new $100 billion stock repurchase plan and a higher dividend. So overall, the market liked what it heard. And some of the tech-associated names this morning in Europe are also benefiting on the, on the back of that as well. So if you're looking at the German stocks, people like Infineon up about a percent, uh, ST Micro up in France as well about 2%, so on and so forth. One thing, though, <laughs> that I just want to make clear is... You know, Apple, just like Goldman Sachs in the banking sector, are an absolute master magician at trying to lower market expectations in order that they always exceed that of street expectations. Uh, and this is what I was kind of looking at yesterday was over the previous two weeks, their share price had dropped approximately 8%. Before now, it's seen a bit of a pickup. So although the shares were up about 3% yesterday, you know, it's kind of almost like they were speaking to the Wall Street analysts who were setting then the tone for what was the, the metrics to meet, uh, and they've superseded it like pretty much they always do. So good numbers nonetheless, um, and, and maybe just worth keeping an eye later on that how the tech sector performs. Also, of course, you might have heard good news for Sam North. Facebook have a new dating app, so hopefully... He can, he can uh, strike lucky this weekend. Anyway, moving on, we've got the oil infantries came out last night. And not too much of a move in the markets. This was the actual numbers. We had crude headline build of 3.427 million. Uh, this was slightly higher than anticipated. Cushing, a build of 725,000. Gasoline, a build of 1 million distillates draw. Uh, of 4 million. Uh, overall, though, as you would see from the WTI crude futures, there's been very little significant kind of direct movement. I mean, this is the, if I mark up the candle that I'm looking at here, it's this one. And really, the market's not really moved at all. And that's because a lot of people in the energy market are focusing on different things. Uh, one thing to be aware of is that the timing. So President Trump, of course, uh, is due to give an update on whether or not they will pull or he will pull the US out of the Iran nuclear accord by the 12th of May deadline and reimpose sanctions on the Persian Gulf nation uh, continue to remain in doubt. 
a couple of comments out of Goldman's, and I think this is kind of really um, summarizes what's keeping oil relatively well supported at the moment, because I agree. They see a moderate response to higher prices from American shale producers, an increasing likelihood that OPEC and allies will extend their supply cuts through next year. Again, that's not really a new thing. I think that is the broader market consensus and what we believe. Um, and so I think the infantry numbers are kind of insignificant, really, at the moment. It's more just a, a fleeting moment of volatility, I'd say. I don't think people are really looking at the, the definition of kind of long-lasting market um, direction. Just want to touch on a couple of points before I hand over to Sam. Uh, and this is in response to UK politics because Theresa May faces confrontation over EU customs partnership. And why are people talking about this this morning? That's because today she has a Brexit cabinet committee meeting. So give you an overview of what people are talking about in the FT this morning as Theresa May is, is facing confrontation from Tory Eurosceptics over her support for a new hybrid customs partnership between Britain and the EU. And what this has led to is that 60, 60 Tory MPs from the pro-Leave European Research Group have written to the Prime Minister Theresa May ahead of this meeting today, warning that the proposal was unworkable. So keep in mind, this European Research Group, which is pro-Leave, which is the, otherwise known as the ERG, is of course led by Jacob Rees-Mogg, who's probably the most hard Brexit view of the main cabinet. Now, of course, the number required as part of UK law to call a vote of no confidence in your Prime Minister is 48. Now, apparently there's 60 Tory MPs from that pro-leave group uh, which, have, which are highly critical of the current plan for Theresa May on how to deal with the customs union. So just something, I don't think it's, you know, it's going to happen immediately. But certainly, if there was enough appetite of people really not happy with how the PMs dealt with this, you know, could they pull the trigger and call that vote of no confidence? I mean, yet to be seen, but certainly something I think that's worth considering because, of course, uh, Amber Rudd, who was the pro-European former Home Secretary, recently resigned. Uh, and that has weakened the pro-European voice within the inner cabinet, so to speak, because as we've read, Sajid Javid, the new Home Secretary, a reluctant Remainer, and has been making some more Brexit-esque type commentary. So definitely worth keeping an eye on this situation. And this, of course, does lead us into this, which is tomorrow. But just to give you a bit of a flavor of, of why people might be talking about the local elections, uh, there's a total of 151 councils holding elections uh, in addition to five London authorities who are, lo are electing local mayors. A um, couple of key points here, because as per an election or the EU referendum, there's always key kind of staple strongholds, if you like, that if they switch could be a real sentiment game changer, potentially as well, given the precarious nature of the leadership of Theresa May. And so Wandsworth and Westminster, the FT are suggesting that um, people should keep a close eye on um, because Westminster has been conservative since its formation in 1964, Wandsworth since 1978. Uh, but changing demographics and discontent over public services and housing have altered the equation. Don't forget as well, in terms of voting to stay within Europe, Westminster voted 69% to stay, Wandsworth 75% to stay. Uh, and both areas swung to Labour in last year's general election. So you can almost imagine the headlines written in the paper, right? If Labour and Corbyn win Westminster as an area, I think that you, you can just imagine what the papers would be making out of that. A couple of other things to, to be aware of as well. It's, you know, I think one of the biggest mistakes financial markets have made is London. London is a bubble. Let's just refer to London as Londinium. It is by nowhere near reflective of the rest of Britain. And I think that's a really important thing to take away from the political events that have happened. Uh, and so really, the Midlands and the North are very key because of London being a notoriously bad barometer of national opinion. 
Uh, and so Labour will look to dislodge the Conservatives. One of the key areas up north is Trafford in Greater Manchester and also Dudley, of where UKIP currently holds the balance. But, I mean, UKIP, the last time we had these same seats up for, for, um, up for grabs in 2014, if you remember 2014, this is when UKIP was right on the front foot, you know, on the attack with Farage, you know, kind of the main headline grabber, whereas now you might as well forget about it. UKIP is just a broken party at this point. Um, how the parties might react to these local elections, I mean, the reason why people look at them traditionally is because they tend to act as a bit of a litmus test for, for, for national sentiment into how the government's currently running the country. Now, if you went back to the beginning of the year, uh, a lot of people might have looked at this for a potential challenge that could destabilise Mrs May's premiership, but you do need to take into context the fact that actually pretty much Jeremy Corbyn's handling uh, about this uh, anti-Semitic uh, situation, how he's dealt with the anti-Semitism in the Labour Party has been a disaster for him. And actually, the Conservative Party are more popular in the national polls uh, at the moment. So I think that risk has dissipated potentially a little bit. But just thought I'd point out a couple of these points. Again, I wouldn't say you trade this type of information right now. But I point it out because really, uh, I think Theresa May is not completely safe at this point. I did ask Sam this morning, what are the bookies looking at? if May was to go, well, actually, Jeremy Corbyn is the second favourite to become Prime Minister. But in terms of the Conservative Party, it would be Jacob Rees-Mogg. And if that were to materialise, and let's say there wasn't a vote of no confidence, you know, you've got to start thinking about scenario building. What actually might you do to the pound in the short term as a trait? My initial thoughts would be, if May goes, this would heighten the prospects of then Mog probably coming in or at least short-term political instability. So you might get a pound negative only then if the, you know, the dominoes fall and this leads to other things like a, a new election, a second referendum, which ultimately might lead down the route of a more softer Brexit, then you could have a more medium to long-term rally. So we'll see. Just something to, to bear in mind. A few other headlines. Uh, just quickly, you've had the PMIs coming out globally this morning. So to give you an update, Japan's service PMI was a six-month high. Surveys in China show shrinking export orders at Chinese manufacturers. We just had the Italian manufacturing PMI come in. A little bit weaker than expected, but Spain was a little bit higher than expected. We're looking out for the German and European ones shortly. And then finally, later on this evening, of course, you get the FOMC interest rate decision. I would say this is largely a non-event. I don't think there's going to be too much change overall. Why? Because the market's looking for June for that type of activity to materialize. The one key area I'd say is summarized in this one line here is how the FOMC choose to alter the characterization of inflation is important. Inflation, we know... This has been one of the key concerns that has led to an idea of policy tightening, dollar strength that we've been seeing, this kind of yield play moving back above that key 3% in the 10-year. It's all to do with inflationary pressures. So how they talk about that, I think, will be the, the subtlety that may end up um, moving the market. Looking at the calendar, otherwise, uh, construction PMI, that's coming out at 9.30, as I say. It's probably the, the lesser important of the PMIs comparative to the manufacturing and certainly to the service number we'll get tomorrow for the UK, but certainly worth keeping an eye on. Eurozone, this is the flash prelim GDP. So again, worth monitoring. And then in the afternoon, we start getting the build up for the, the jobs report on Friday non-farm. So we'll get ADP. Uh, that is expected at 200,000. Quick look at ADP, 200,000, I think, is no concern for the market. Yes, that is off the recent four-month average, but keeps us at a relatively robust rate of growth. I did see an interesting statistic this morning. So anyone doing the, the calling the headline figure, well, ADP's initial estimate of the April specific calendar month, April change in private non-farm payrolls under, underestimated the BLS, so the non-farms first release, 
in nine of the last 10 years and by an average of 64,000. However, in the last two years, it did only do so by about 16,000. So you know, these are the sorts of stats if you want to have a bit more of an accurate um, guesstimate, if you like, for the headline changing on farm payrolls. These are the kinds of stats that I'll be looking at. But again, as we know, no one is really bothered by the number of jobs being created. It's the average hourly earnings, which undoubtedly will be key again. Okay, let me hand you over to Sam. Wish you all a good day, and I'll catch you in the chat room. Thank you. Yeah, hi guys, let's have a quick look over uh, the charts here. Euro just, oh, there's a tricky one there, it did pop above the pivot only to come back down now since then. I think it would have thrown you know, from a technical point of view, even with the, you know, the lower tier uh, data coming out just before before the hour, you know, it was quite an interesting resistance level. Immediately we tested a couple of times yesterday, but along with the pivot, not the worst idea to, to look to have got in for a short. And we now, unfortunately, you know, you probably would have got stopped out if you had come in and, and now back on towards the pivot. Um, I'd still be looking today to, to overall to continue the, the, the trend of this market. You know, you've got interesting area if we were to get a bit uh, a bit higher up with the R1 where you'd expect a good level of resistance and even before that using the pullback areas from, from yesterday morning slash afternoon let me just mark those up here we can see a bit higher up from where we are whether we, we can get to that point it remains to be seen I obviously have the, the lows from today and yesterday clearly marked up on the chart if we were to get a breakdown as well through that we look on this this longer chart we just remove it all here just to clear it up a bit mark as in in terms of the actual market level back on the 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 lows that we had of the year now suddenly not too far away having made that that double top uh late jan early feb seems a long way away now uh, for this uh, currency pair another market which has been continuing to slide to the downside i think you've got to again favor uh, continuation of that is is cable and what it looks quite decent again would be the, the, the similar to euro in, in the pivot area but having seen that I'll just be a bit a bit careful you know obviously what you, you generally will get after a, a significant move to the downside is sometimes that slow grind uh, higher uh, on the next day so I wouldn't be expecting similar sort of price action to yesterday as of yet um, and ideally looking to to continue the trend from as, as high up as possible. But let's just see how that, that pans out. I think if we look where pound is trading right now, it can even quite make uh, the key resistance area of here, having broken to a new high, just coming off those points now. I think, again, we've been focusing on, on the previous sort of lows of the day to see if we can get a push through there or, or higher up to, to continue uh, the trend. Oil, which similar to the currency pairs which had a decent enough down day yesterday has just been grinding a bit higher now key level to the upside 68 uh, dollar handle just a bit above on the futures you can see was support before we break through and uh, really was the ceiling in the afternoon just before the sort of the what was the NYMEX open at two o'clock uh, having pushed down the initial first sort of test of the, the low of the, the 30th was strong we pushed higher uh, before then making a, a break through that into the sort of the, the latter part of the session and since then it's just been grinding higher obviously 330 you have the the oil numbers out um, so something just to, to bear in mind there API reaction obviously limited but to the upside I think oil would I go short around there I mean if we look at the what oil has been doing for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine trading days just that I've got here on picture. If around that area, we absolutely bang in the middle. I'm not sure what I really expect. Might be a case of just sort of waiting and see for, for oil uh, to really get a clearer picture of what exactly is going on. Equities as well, which started coming down uh, to the back end of the European session, had a decent pounce into the closing and made a new high just before uh, half nine, which is pretty incredible, was the it was coming down quite strong. The Dow Jones really leading the way there, and you can see even that had a strong 
uh, bounce higher as well. I think, you know, as mentioned a couple of times, the equities don't really have an overall direction at the moment. I mean, you can look at this and just see how, how, me how messy it is. It's really in this sort of consolidation phase. Technical levels, uh, you know, not being respected too well. You get a bit of a false break out there of the lows of the 24th and 5th, only to then push higher. I think there's better markets to be looking at right now, uh, especially for the mornings. You know, wait and see uh, after that sort of increase in volume from the cash open. And yeah, breaks and lows and highs have, have been quite good in terms of opportunities. Uh, but I think, yeah, definitely better to, to focus uh, elsewhere. We'll have a quick look over as well at, uh, at the DAX, which you can see really pushing higher still. If we have a look where this puts us in the grand scheme of things for, for the DAX, it's the highest since that uh, infamous day of this year, the 2nd of Feb. So, well, obviously not towards the high of that, but it would have been around sort of the early hours of the 2nd of Feb where we were here. And you can see pretty interesting what was support there on the on the, the, the low of January. We broke through that, just being really sort of tested now. So keep an eye on, on DAX, obviously dragging Euro stocks higher to, towards its R2 as well. Let's have a quick look over at the FTSE, which, yeah, similar to sort of Eurostock being being pushed higher. Obviously, the weaker pound has really helped FTSE push on, and you can see really since the uh, the back end of, of March has been on on, on sort of a, a one direction course. There, we put on the Amplify Instagram poll yesterday. Um, what's going to make all time highs first out of the FTSE and the S&P. In terms of, of percentage, well, the, I think, well, as I checked yesterday, S&P was a clear winner. In terms of percentage move to those all-time highs, you've got FTSE 3.2% away. Let's have a look at the S&P from where we're trading now. Obviously, I'll just do it roughly 8.5% away. So something just to bear in mind, I think, uh, just how close the FTSE actually is now. Having been, you know, down uh, in, in the lows that we saw at the back end uh, of March, we really have recovered quite strongly. And, and the weaker pound, you know, now, well, I guess odds on that it is not going to be a rate hike as well. Could see FTSE continue to, to push higher. It really has been on a, a sort of a one direction uh, run here. Having a look over the other couple of currency pairs that we really focus on here, just to, to wrap the, the briefing up before we have a look at, at gold as well. You see Aussie dollar being pushing higher. Quite an interesting level I have marked up on, on my charts with the R1 and also the area of support from yesterday. And we've had decent price action on previous days as well. So just something to, to bear in mind there. That could be a good area where people long would look to take profit and people looking to continue the trend. Uh, can get short. We have, however, broken this trend that we've been on for the last couple of, of days where the highs have been respected. So again, just something to, to bear in mind. But we're just coming off the, the sort of the, the high of the day as we speak. Dollar Yen, still pushing on, making a new high each day for the quite, uh, quite a while here. In terms of the, the sort of the longer time frame, let me just put this on a daily chart. We're at quite an interesting point in the market now. Was resistance uh, on the 8th of Feb, the high there. We're just sort of testing that now. And, and the first sort of failed push, I guess you could say, was was uh, just not long ago. We have since come back down. So key level for, for dollar yen uh, would be a good place for anyone sort of in a, a medium term, longer term position to look to take profit on here. Uh, the dollar index itself is coming off better levels. Uh, so decent decent point in the market. For, for dollar then, yen there, so I'll just be careful about perhaps looking to go too aggressively to continue the overall trend of the last couple of weeks. Gold pivot has acted well uh, this morning as we've seen sort of a pullback from yesterday's stronger dollar move. I like the look of the, the sort, well, let me just get the rectangle out, a bit higher up perhaps to, to look to continue, continue the short. Uh, although focus would really be for, for gold come the afternoon and, and wait to sort of see what happens with this dollar? Are we going to get continuation or is it going to be uh, a tricky day in the markets where it, we might just get choppy price action to, uh, towards the upside for, the, for these dollar related uh, markets uh, as well? Oil just trying to, to stabilize above that pivot. Gasoline as well just pushing towards its higher point for, 
for the day as well. So good correlation still working between those two uh, there as well. T notes almost finding support on, well, I did find support, sorry, on the, the low of the 27th. I'll keep an eye on that if we can get a breakthrough uh, while the volume is obviously nowhere near its, uh, its highest at this time in the morning. If we were to get a confirmed break of that in the S1 area, suddenly, again, you're, you're looking at uh, that uh, multi-month low to that point as well. The Bund, which gapped lower, did push and then repaired the losses. Pivot acting as a good level of resistance. I'll be keeping an eye on that pivot level for the potential of a break and then the gap fill to where we sort of close there. For now, though, that's holding up quite nicely. The dollar index is coming off those highs. Wouldn't necessarily be expecting to see a massive continuation straight away of the, the sort of the market moves we saw yesterday where you know the pound was weak and the dollar was also strong and the euro and Aussie dollar were all following. Uh, it was quite a, a good day in the markets for holding the trade to their intended sort of market uh, targets. Uh, so for now, I think a bit more patience would be needed. Any questions as usual, please do get them in the chat. And if not, I hope you have a, a good trading day.